Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. This is our KISS worship service, keeping it shorter and simpler. I hope you've had a great week. I hope you're taking care of yourself. I hope you're getting outside and enjoying some of this incredible weather. I, I'm taping here on a Thursday of the week, and uh, yesterday and today are just absolutely phenomenal. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you're in the scriptures and praying and taking care of those that belong to you and those that are neighbors as Christ would define them. Thank you for your support, for your support of the ministries, for your own personal ministries, for your financial support. It's wonderful. We're having a meeting this evening uh, to talk about the reopening and by next week I should have a calendar for you to let you know what the dates are for Sunday schools and these kind of things. They're prepping right now for Vacation Bible School. There'll be information uh, on the website for you. And uh, if you have children or grandchildren, you want to share it with them. We're talking about having a big kind of an outside event with uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and such. And uh, maybe some games. Some, I don't want to really get into it, but some things for children and uh, should be a blast coming up. You know, I met this men are prepping up. I think their first meeting is going to be in August, an in-person meeting. Fantastic. The uh, men are meeting Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. at uh, the Village Restaurant for breakfast, coffee, fellowship, prayer, support. You're welcome to come to that. United Methodist women are in the process of trying to figure out how it is that they're going to move forward. The ministries with the food pantries is still going. Uh, we have uh, the Ascension one, the Feed Kempsville uh, part. And then there are other places that our people are actually actively involved in helping to pack out food. We don't have a food pantry here, but as you know, we collect food for Ascension and for other places. Some of the clubs, the Masonic clubs and stuff, also give to those same pantries. Um, there's a basket here that you can drop it in. We'd rather you take it over to Ascension and drop it straight there so that we don't have to double handle it. Um, but if you need to leave it here, you may do so. Uh, obviously, financial uh, things can come through the email or through the, uh, <laughs> through the web through the mail or through the box. And to remind you that we have service 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings now, which includes hymns and communion and uh, singing. It's, uh, it's really been incredible to be back together and to experience each other's presence. Still some social distancing and such going on three feet. There are some sections for folks that uh, aren't comfortable with three feet and they're measured out so that we have six feet. Uh, masks for anyone that is not fully vaccinated. The rest of the folks are welcome to take their masks off while they're in worship. I think that's about all I have. Um, again, I hope you're well. I'm really glad you came to worship God. Let's take a couple moments to center ourselves on Christ as we begin our worship of God. Let us pray. say to you that if you'd like a copy of the bulletin while you're worshiping, you can go online to the website and pull one off. Would you join me in the call to worship? With friends and strangers, with family and neighbors, we gather. Come, come among us, healing God, with that love which never ends. With faith reaching out to touch, with hearts straining to trust, we hope. Come among us, friend of the broken, with your compassion which makes us whole. With word and wonder, with silence and song, we wait. Come among us, 
dryer of tears to lift us on our feet to follow you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we're slow to see the blood around our feet. We get self-absorbed or we deny our own power to act and to be of service. We forget that we are made whole by a wonder by a wounded healer. Forgive us, we pray. Free us to use power right and to serve you joyfully through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in the utmost eagerness, and in our agape love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your agape love against the eagerness of others. For you, know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something now to finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if your eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance, as it is written. The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul's kind of tough sometimes to understand. He twists and he turns. Let us pray. Lord, open us to receive from you, open us to share with you. Bring each of us this morning a word particular to our needs. Speak it to us in a way that we can receive it. May it challenge us and pull us forward in our becoming a disciple of you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I want to start by saying to you that... <laughs> If this is all we have, if the earth is all we have, if this length of time that we exist on earth is all we have, that's all there is, then what Paul wrote and what I'm going to talk about this morning doesn't make any sense at all. But, if this is but a foreshadow of what is to come, and our existence here continues in something else, and we don't cease to exist, and Christ really did live, and Christ really did die, and Christ really was raised from the dead, and Christ really is our disciple, and Christ, as it says in John 14, went away and is coming back to take us to where he is. Then this passage and these thoughts that I have, and Paul had, are probably really, really important and powerful things. I want to say to you that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church as a disciple of Christ. And he wrote to disciples of Christ. Now, I want to stop there and explain something, if I may. Um, we are not disciples for Christ. We are disciples of Christ. 
And what that means is that we are taking on the nature of Christ. We're not doing something for a king. We are becoming like the king. We're becoming like Christ. And so we are taking on the nature of of Christ. And what that means is that, that as we move through this world, that we are becoming more and more what Christ was when Christ was here. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, look, you're excelling in much, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, as all disciples of Christ should. In faith, in speech, in knowledge. Now, Paul's not apple polishing these people. Paul is actually saying, I've, you know, I've heard about what you're doing. I've received reports, and your faith is strong. It probably should be noted that in, in Paul's day, uh, remember what Paul did. Paul actually was sent out by the Jewish church to go and find Christians and to destroy their faith. And after being called by Jesus to be a follower, a disciple, and then as Paul would say, he also became an apostle. Um, he then tried to get people to increase their faith in the midst of a time when having faith in Christ really was not a good thing. It got you into to much trouble. And so when Paul was saying to folks, look, you are excelling in faith, he's really lifting them up and saying, this is an amazing thing. In the midst of a time like what we have, in the midst of the oppression that we have, your faith is excelling. He says, you're excelling in, in, your, fee, in, in your speech. Now, when I hear that, what I understand him to be saying is, not only are you excelling in your faith, but you're also excelling in sharing your faith with other people. Both of these things are things that disciples should do. You and I should be excelling in our faith. Our faith should be growing. There's not a week that goes by that I don't ask somebody, how you doing spiritually? Or as John Wesley would say, how is it with your soul? How is your faith? How are you doing? And in this pandemic, what I hear over and over is not well. A few people here and there seem to be doing well, but the majority of the folks that I talk with tell me not well. I think a lot of that has to do with the dynamics of not being able in the, to be in the presence of, of other disciples not to be able to serve as people have served in the past in, in cooperation and in close contact with others. That's coming to a close, thank God. And I think it's going to help people to be able to... I talked with a couple guys this week and they told me that you know they were not doing well. And I said, hey, come on out to the Tuesday Men's Bible Study where you know we have a cup of coffee, we have some fellowship, if you want some breakfast, you know, we have a time of prayer. And so, you know, that's what that's about. I can't wait for the women to get something up so that the ladies can get back together, the women of the church, and spend a little close contact with each other, lifting each other up. The, uh, I can't wait for the Sunday schools to begin to do that. The youth have already started. He says, you're excelling in much in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge. You know, knowledge is an incredibly important part of discipleship. We have to understand things to get a bedrock. There was a group of people called Gnostics, and Gnosticism was based on, uh, if I can boil it down to a rule for you, that you had to have certain knowledge in order to be saved. You were saved through knowledge. Well, Christians do not believe that. United Methodists, we don't believe that. But I will say to you that the knowledge gives us a bedrock upon which to build. And it is important for us to have that underpinning, that boilerplate upon which we can build the rest of our faith system. Upon which we can uh, actually begin to speak with other people. If we don't have the knowledge, it's difficult to, to discuss with people faith issues. Paul says, listen, you're excelling in faith, in speech, and knowledge. He says, and so then, by experiencing also the agape love offered by Christ and other disciples, you have utmost eagerness to be generous or to share your generosity in the care of others. 
Paul was testing the genuineness of their agape love. You know, was it lip service? Were they actually just saying that they loved other people? You know, one thing that I have learned about Christianity, Christendom, folks that call themselves Christians, is that it's very possible for people to, to experience the love of Christ um, in such a limited manner as to desire to have for them a chit that they can carry to heaven and turn it in at the pearly gates and walk in and get their mansion. And that's all there is to it. However, I would say to you that I don't understand that to be Christianity. I will say to you that I think that that is the first step. That is the beguiling piece that calls people into relationship with God. That of being forgiven for sins. That of finding a God who has been looking for them and and realizing that this God loves them enough that he died for them. I, I think that that is the first step of becoming a disciple, becoming a Christian. I would say that anyone who gets stuck at that particular point where it's all about them receiving that chit, that moment, that, that thing, getting saved, and that's where it stops. There's a serious, serious problem. A serious problem. Because that is such an immature faith... The, that it is almost no faith at all. Um, faith in oneself, faith in God so that you receive something is almost no faith at all. It's on the edge. Um, Jesus did not come to save us. Jesus did not come to save you and to save me. Jesus came to save the world. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to the world. I mean, just listen to the words that, that the disciples said to him. Hey, will you teach us to pray? He said, sure. Our Father who art in heaven prays. Holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the central piece of Jesus' prayer. It doesn't say, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thanks for saving me. Thanks for making a place for me. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This has been handed over to you and to me to do. We are to bring the kingdom. Paul, many people have a problem with Paul because uh, A, he's convoluted and B, he really presses people to become the disciples that, that I believe that God wants us to be. Lip service about the genuineness of agape love is something that Paul had a problem with, and quite frankly, I do too. Uh, the question is, do you understand how to live agape love, or will you just talk about it? Paul goes on to say, listen, Christ offered the gift of agape love. Having all power and all ability, Christ came and gave to us something. And then we were called to mimic him. Being a disciple of Jesus, we're desired to live into the reality of agape, love. I talk about this on a regular basis, and you may get tired of hearing it, but until we fully understand it, I'm not going to stop talking about it. Love is not philos. Love is not... I love you, you love me. It's not Barney love. I love you, you love me. You know, it's agape love says I don't care about whether you love me or not. Whether you friend me or not. Whether you eros me or not. Whether you storge me or not. Whether we're family or not. Jesus taught that we're to love the people who are neighbors. Who are neighbors? All the folks around us, both those that we like and dislike. When I came to this church years ago, I said to you guys, uh, some of you I won't like and some of you I will, but it will not matter. I will treat you as though I love you and that love will be based on the kind of love that you... That really disturbed some people and I had some folks in my office saying, you don't like me? And I said, I think you're missing the point. 
the point is it doesn't matter whether I like you or not. And you're called to live and to love people irrespective of what you think of them. Your job, my job, is to raise other people up, to lift them up. If we don't like a particular person, if we don't like a particular people, if we don't like a particular way that they live, none of that is to matter. Jesus, I'm quite sure, didn't like certain people, didn't like individuals, didn't like certain peoples, didn't like certain attitudes, the way they lived. And yet Jesus agaped all people. Jesus died on the cross for people who rejected him. Jesus loved, agaped the guys that were driving nails through his hands, through his feet. The guy who stabbed him with a spear. Pilate. <laughs> the Jewish people that, that sent him to Pilate. Jesus agaped all these folks. This is an amazing thing. There is not a person in this world that's come through that Jesus has not agape Every single person from the very worst to those that are the least worst. And so, being a disciple of Christ, we're to desire, we're to, desire to live into the reality of agape. That is, desiring to share the agape through experience of agape. One thing that I know is that somebody who does not have a lot of agape to share with other people, they have not personally experienced much agape. Inside of the community um, where folks go off for a weekend um, kind of a spiritual retreat, there's a group that, that does that. Uh, some of you know about it. And uh, one of the things that happens over those weekends is that you're you're just washed over and over and over with agape love. Little teeny notes, little teeny pieces of paper that have things, stupid little erasers that have God's love, different things on it. Emmaus community. You're you're washed over and over and over. And people spend lots of money and lots of time doing stuff for folks that, that they don't even know who they are. And after experiencing that for two or three days, it really does begin to affect who and what you are. Because I know some of you just don't receive enough love. I ask folks every week, are you getting enough love? And when I say that, I'm not asking, how's your spouse treating you? And yet I am. I'm asking you, how are you doing in experiencing love from other people and from God? Because one thing I know, if you do not experience love and you do not experience it from family, from friends, from others, from God, from people in church, then your well will run low. And as your well runs low, you'll be less apt to pass on agape love to other people. That is those who are not family, those who are not friends, those who you're not attracted to, you will be less apt to pass it on to the others. Paul says we share agape by sharing our abundance of agape with those in need. Paul talked about a fair balance. He said, um, you know, a fair balance uh, is important. Justice is important. He, I want to say to you that agape in my mind is not just, it's not just the way that we talk with people. It's not just the way that we treat people. It's also expressed by the way that we empower people. I said earlier that, you know, does your agape exist only in lip service or is it real? When it costs you something, then it begins to be important to you. If it doesn't cost you anything, it really isn't important. I think the reason that Jesus spoke more about finances than he did any other subject is because he understood with clarity that contained in the financial system is the majority of the power that most people have. And that when people take from their power and give to other people power, 
It is an expression of the deepest core of their understanding of what God has done for them. And I think that's why in the Old Testament there was a 10% rule that was designed for the religious people to follow. That, that the best and the first of the fruits of their labors, of animals, of, of um, provisions from the ground, these things were to be given the first, the best. You know, the blemished ones were, were not good enough, that it had to be the best ones. Then when we come to the New Testament, and particularly when we come to, to these years that we live in, uh, most of us don't have uh, farms anymore. Most of us don't, have, don't raise animals. We, we don't have crops. We don't give that anymore. And so now it's been changed over to a monetary system. And so the question is, are we giving our first fruits to God, to the kingdom? Now, Paul in this scripture talks about caring for other people and the genuineness of our care in underpinning other, underpinnings, my, my word, it's, uh, it's my old economic um, kind of uh, thought process. But I ask you, are you underpinning the lives of those around you that, that are hurting? Financially, are you underpinning them? How are you doing with your generosity, as Paul says? How's your generosity for others? This, this statement that Paul uses talking about fair balance and justice, he says, The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. And he talks about the one who had little having an abundance out of the abundance of the one who had much. Well, that's an interesting concept. That says that the guy whose bucket is full... And the guy whose bucket is empty, the guy whose bucket is empty is filled to abundance by the guy whose bucket is filled to abundance already. This is a hard conversation for a lot of people. If we understand, as I said at the beginning, if we understand that here on earth is all we have, then as I said, Paul's words and my words will make no sense at all. None. None. Zero. Keep everything you have. Protect all you have. Build hedges around all you have. Build walls around all you have. Save all you have. Keep all you have. Don't give away anything. Go to a restaurant. Give the girl 2%. As my wife used to say, little old ladies would come in after church and she said it was the hardest hour, the hardest hour, because he said the little old ladies would come in and they would eat and they would stay forever and then leave a quarter, leave a nickel, leave a dime. And she said to me one time, you know, my grandmother was the same way. Even in her abundance, she did not see. I ask you. In your abundance, do you see the need, the justification, the, the justice? Are you generous? And in your lack, do you see the justice by having relationship with those that have? And let me stop here, and this is not a part of the scripture at all, but it's just simply a part of who and what I am. We need to be better at ruling our own lives. We need to be better at ruling our own lives. And for those of us that are in trouble, we need to be better about doing what we do to help ourselves and to be able to move to a point where we can help other people. Having said that, I'm well aware that there are a lot of things that go into that. And um, we may talk about that in one of the Sunday School lessons coming up soon. Um, certainly culture and um, mental health and education and social things, they all feed into a system. Um, it's troubling for me that folks don't have any money at all and yet have, you know, a thousand dollar cell phone. Uh, anyway, don't want to get into it. It's, it's part of the whole process. It's part of maybe what Satan's using on my side to, to make me say, okay, these folks need to do better taking care of themselves. 
Um, I think they need to do better taking care of themselves. And I think I have an obligation, not to them, but because of Christ giving to me, I have an obligation to Christ to care for them. And that's what takes away my angst as I take care of other people. Listen, a lot more to say. Need to stop. I say to you, and the world experiences, as the world experiences the infusion of agape love, the world is changed into the kingdom of God, and the lives of those living are improved. Both those who have abundance and those who receive abundance. Go into the world and um, chew on this this week, and may Christ bless you because of it. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, for the blessings that you bring to us. I thank you for the abundance that we experience. I thank you for the poverty of others around us so that we may underpin their lives, thus opening the conversation of your love. Those that have a lot in this world are the hardest for us to talk to because they're able to stand on their own. Help us to use what tools we have to be able to share your love with other people and thus open the conversations about your love for them too. Help us, Jesus, with the power of your Spirit, with your pervenient grace that, that moves before we get there. May it also move on us. May justification and sanctification come and work on us. May you be proud of what we do and yet calling us ever more to do more. Thank you for the church. Thanks for its power in this world. Thanks for the hope, love, joy, and peace that it brings into this world. Thank you, Jesus, for being rich and yet becoming poor and offering us so very, very much. In your holy, holy name we pray. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me in praying a blessing on the offerings that we've received this week and that we may empower them and infuse them with our love and God's love as, as these monies go into the world to bring Christ's kingdom. Let us pray. Lord, take these gifts as they're placed in your hand through the church. Empower them, infuse them with your spirit. Infuse them with the love and the grace that, that has come through the giving. And send them into the world to bring your kingdom. To bring an opportunity to share your love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Hope your week is great. Hope you're taking care of each other. Hope you're spending time in the scriptures. Start reading the gospels if you're not reading the Bible. Start reading the gospels. Have a great week. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go and be a better disciple tomorrow than you were yesterday. Amen. Blessings. Blessings.